Excellent. Um, I'm going to be talking about the state of vector tiles. Um, uh, and uh, my name is Dane Springmeyer. I work for Mapbox. And uh, if you go to the conference site, if you want to download my slides, there's two ways. You can squint your eyes and type in that URL. Or at any time later, you can go to the conference website to the Vector Tiles talk page. And I just commented there with the link to my slides that you can download. There's a few videos, so they're fairly large. Um, so if you can follow along today and maybe just download them later, that would probably, probably be easiest. OK. So I work for a company called Mapbox. Um, we have 10 speakers at the conference this year, which I'm really proud of. So you, you probably heard of us. Um, we got started out of a garage in uh, Washington, DC. Um, but we're growing to 80 designers, developers, and cartographers, and strategists now, open data strategists. And um, basically, we're building a platform for highly custom web maps at scale, and increasingly the same for data. Um, and we now have offices also in San Francisco, in addition to Washington, DC. OK, so where are we headed today? I'm going to talk about vector tiles, and I'm going to hopefully help those of you that haven't heard about vector tiles get a good basic sense of what they are uh, and what they do and why you might be interested in them, in them as a solution or might not. Um, and then I'm also going to dive deep into some of the history um, and motivations, um, and then some really interesting new implementations of the vector tile spec. Um, which, because it is an open specification that anyone, anyone can write code uh, to use. So that's, that's where we're headed. So the motivation, for those of you that haven't heard of vector tiles yet, the motivations might be a little out of context, but I wanted to put them right up front because I wanted to be honest about kind of how we think about vector tiles and um, to help you understand. So yeah, what, what are the motivations behind the technology? Well, uh, the, the main goal was find an efficient way to ship data to the client, so the web browser, um, because we had this in mind. We had the idea of Mapbox GL, which Vlad and Nikki, my colleagues, talked about previously. Um, it is an incredible technology, and we had this in mind when we were creating the spec. We wanted um, to be able to render fully, fully baked base maps in the browser uh, dynamically, not just a few overlays. Uh, so we wanted a format that would power that. So it's a foundation for map writing Mapbox GL. But many of you that have heard about vector tiles know that they existed before Mapbox GL. So they've also uh, evolved for other reasons. Um, one main reason was to solve the performance ch challenge that we faced in TileMill, which was uh, you could make TileMill, um, which is a desktop tile render, if you haven't heard of it. We could make it fast. Um, but uh, as more and more people were using it, more and more people getting excited about it, from nonprofits to big businesses, we were finding that we were doing a lot of support, individual support on how to optimize their systems. So it felt, it, it felt like we were going from beautiful maps to kind of database optimization. Um, and, and it felt extra challenging because people are often using TileMill on brand new Macs with a lot of CPUs, and there's a lot of rendering potential. But is their shapefile indexed, or it, what projection is it in, or Maybe they imported it in, in a PostGIS, but they don't know how to tune PostGIS. And they're just a journalist with a deadline tomorrow. So uh, this was an exciting challenge for a little while. It was a motivator, because I love helping people. I got into open source because I love working with people, not because I'm a good software developer. But ultimately, we, we realized that, what's that? V Vlad, Vlad took issue with that comment, but um, <laughs> I'm learning from the greats. So but it quickly became. Over, an overload. We, we couldn't focus on what mattered, um, which was, in our mind, helping people make beautiful maps that are new to the mapping field and not necessarily having to teach them PostGIS. Um, so we came up with Mapbox Studio, which basically divided TileMill in half. It took the rendering part of TileMill and moved it over here to a style section, and it took the data prep side and moved it over to a vector tile studio. And basically, that solved a performance problem for people that just want to style maps. Um, and oh, I'll go back. So, so you can go to Mapbox Studio, and there's a styling mode where all the data is ready for you. And it streams in as vector tiles. So it answered the question, how to make fast, beautiful maps for people that uh, we don't want to have to teach about Postgres or indexing geodata. OK, there were other motivators, though. We wanted to scale server-side rendering. Um, so we wanted to support client-side rendering, but we also wanted to serv scale server-side rendering. Because the Mapbox static map API uh, and our tiles API are and cont will continue to be for a very long time 
serving out image tiles, because a lot of applications support this, and it's really an awesome thing. Uh, as, as you heard from Vlad, like Leaflet is not going away. Leaflet is based off of uh, image tiles. It's a really simple, elegant way to do maps on the web. So we're going to continue supporting tile APIs with image maps. But at the time, before vector tiles, we were pre-caching all the image tiles for the world. And that was very, very slow and not scalable, because we wanted to do thousands of different styles, not just one. So the motivation was also about scaling out server-side rendering. Now take this, this is a static map request where somebody would send a big bounding box, maybe a, a mobile device would say, here's my running route, and, and it just wants to go to the Mapbox API and get an image tile. What actually happens under the hood here on mapbox.com is all dynamically rendered. So we calculate the extents of the static image request. We go down and figure out what vector tiles um, ser will service that request. We go out and get them in multiple threads uh, in, with uh, Node.js servers from Amazon S3. And then we um, basically bring them into a large, um, uh, we bring them all together and composite them and then render all the visual styling on the fly. So we basically go out and get the vector tiles, combine them with the style sheet, uh, add the GeoJSON to that style sheet and render it, and then compress it down to a single image, compress that, quantize that image down to 64 colors, and return it back to the user. So there's so much happening in a style uh, static API request. And before vector tiles, we didn't dare do this, right? If we had to go to a PostGIS database, for example, um, to service this request, how many PostGIS databases would we have to have running in the cloud when a new uh, fitness app wants to use Mapbox and they have uh, 2 million users that want to hit this. So the th you'll hear a theme today about how I'm comparing vector tiles to PostGIS. There are two things I love to death. So don't take me in the wrong way that there's anything wrong with PostGIS. It's just a really good comparison point and something in a, in a database application many of you are familiar with. So uh, when you do this, when you dynamically render styles on the fly for static maps, you can also change them. So we wanted to do this. We wanted to allow people to combine data uh, and then return a single image, which is really easy for, for phones to consume. So the core idea here at the start was Mapnik as producer of vector tiles and also consumer, Mapnik being the rendering engine we use on the server side currently, at least until we ported Mapbox GL to the server side. Keep an eye out for that. So how does that work? So we pre-cache vector tiles now instead of image tiles. So we go from PostGIS in most cases, like for OSM data, we use Mapnik to render the vector tiles and we store those on S3 or you could put them anywhere that's scalable and fast that you don't have to worry about maintaining. Uh, and the key there is you incur the cost of complex, potentially really slow SQL queries that do a lot of computation. And in preparation for cartography, you do that once and without fear if it crashes. There's no users or no uptime that will be lost if something goes wrong. But for production requests, for the APIs uh, requests coming from Pinterest or Foursquare or uh, a breaking news story on a journalism uh, site, uh, this is all we have to do. All we have to do is get the vector tile on S3. It might even be cached so we don't have to hit S3. Then we send it to Mapnik. We don't hit disk. We render it to an image tile, and it's really fast. And we're able to support um, uh, more than 300 requests per second for very complex base maps, um, uh, really independent of load on an auto-scaling uh, infrastructure. So again, the idea was to disassociate database uptime with how our API functions fundamentally. So um, that is to say, the, the capabilities of Postgres, if you dynamically hit it, are incredible. If you were to use it as a base, base for your mapping API, you don't have to look any further than an application in site like CardoDB to know the extreme power of that. Um, but there's a beautiful liberty to Postgres-lessness. Um, and I'm, I'm nowhere pithy enough to have coined this. This is from Mike Magursky in uh, 2003, who really pioneered the, the conceptual brilliance around why vector tiles are going to be so exciting to users that probably don't even have to know that they're used under the hood, which is the idea of allowing anyone to style all of the OpenStreetMap database without ever downloading it, or without using OSN to PGSQL or the other host of fairly complex and heavy error-prone tools that people commonly do to set up rendering servers. So I really recommend you check out this blog post on Postgreslessness from Mike, because um, I don't know if I'd be talking about this today without that, that uh, rush of ideas and, and brilliance of, of his, his ideas. So fundamentally, this is then about separating data from design, which you've also heard my colleague Amy Lee talk about uh, in presentations uh, earlier in the week. Um, 
And it allows us to focus on new hard problems, like Vlad said, which is Mapbox GL, rather than old hard problems like scaling databases. Fundamentally, then, the goal is to sleep well at night. OK, so with that big, honest motivation, now I want to just jump back and say, OK, for those of you that are thinking, OK, what the heck is a vector tile? Let me just describe it real quick. And then again, where we're headed is once I'm done describing the basics of vector tiles, then I'm going to describe some of the uh, coolest new implementations that I think uh, those of you that are software developers or tinkers are just going to want to play with immediately. Or that you might have already heard about, depending on whose talks you've seen. Anyway, so now we're going to talk about what a vector tile is. So it's just the same as an image tile, right? It's easy to cache and serve. It uses the same addressing scheme as image tiles. So you can refer to 000 PNG the same as you could re refer to 000 vector, P vector PBF to get all the data for the world at that zoom level, or any zoom level. And you can, co you can represent many complex layers inside of the vector tile. The difference, though, is the vector tiles contain the source data, like the geometries, road name, area types, building heights, whatever you can dream up of putting in there, like vector data, you can put in vector tiles. But the difference being is they're really compact um, because uh, we're tiling, of course. We're using data partitioning um, to split the data up. And we found that we can put OSM Planet uh, on a single USB stick, so only in the gigabytes range rather than terabytes. Uh, and the design of the spec makes them very fast to parse both client side and server side. And this is the key in lazy or, in or incremental ways. So you can read into just the portion of the tile that you care about, uh, unlike uh, text-based formats like GeoJSON and TopoJSON. However, I have numerous colleagues that are making this slide wrong. Um, Eric Fisher and Arta Pavlenko, Pavlenko uh, Mapbox are both writing uh, lazy GeoJSON and TopoJSON parsers, where they rip through the whole file in a few seconds, build up an R tree, and then they can later use the offsets of where they hit a feature in the large string to read the data almost as efficiently as binary data. So this is, this is sort of going out the window, but um, binary data can be more compact, of course, and easier to read with offsets. So how do they work? Well, you take any uh, traditional geodata and you can put it in vector tiles. Uh, and then this is the structure you get. You can have multiple layers, and a layer can have multiple features. And a feature is going to have a unique ID, a set of attributes, and geometries. Um, the layers are ordered. So if you have multiple, say, post just tables that you want to put inside a vector tile, the vector tile will store and maintain that order. Doesn't mean that you can't rearrange the order for rendering later on, but it does have an ordered and named uh, system. And then to save space with attributes, you can imagine um, you might have a lot of columns named name, and you don't want that repeated a million times. So we use dictionary encoding, where we basically take um, all of the field or keys and values, and we turn them into integers uh, to re report, uh, avoid repeating large strings. We only repeat integers, which is a lot cheaper. And then this one's really key. Um, the geometries we don't store uh, in multiple parts per multi-geometry. We store basically them flattened. So no matter whether you have uh, 100,000 points or a single point, uh, it just become, it's just an array. And it's just the length is based off the number of points. Versus if you were to say store uh, 100,000 multipoints in separate uh, features, then that would be much, much larger. And you could do that in vector tiles, but we allow a way to store multi-part geometries in a flattened way, uh, which compresses much better in protobufs. Um, the caveat there, though, is that we're thinking about better ways to do it and nest, nested structures, which might be still as efficient, um, but would be easier to make sense of when you decode the geometry. So stay, stay tuned there. So, um, but there's other optimizations that we do at the geometry level. Um, we delta encode and zigzag encode, and this really helps the size of the final uh, encoding. So what is delta encoding? Well, it's a way of encoding sequential uh, data by difference. So instead of uh, encoding the original values, you just look at the differences between them. And if uh, the, the vertices are nearby each other, then you en end up encoding small numbers rather than large numbers. Uh, and then zigzag coding is a way of turn turning signed integers into unsigned, so um, potentially positive and negative integers into just positive integers, because then you know you can store that integer in a smaller type. So that's also safe space. And then finally, what we do is we use the Google proto protobuf uh, encoding to serialize it all to a single buffer or string so we can pass that over the wire uh, in a cross-platform way. 
Okay, so there's other concepts which you should be familiar with. One important concept that's a little tricky to understand is overzooming. Um, but the basic idea is that in Mapbox Studio, which is one of the main toolkits that makes it easy to author uh, vector tiles, it has this concept of max zoom. The, and if we chose a max zoom of 14, it doesn't mean that you couldn't view the data at a lower level. It just means that zoom 14 is the last level where we render uh, and simplify data. So uh, basically, we don't have to. If you were to pre-cache all these vector tiles, you don't have to pre-cache billions. You can only pre-cache thousands. Um, but you can still render on the fly uh, billions, down to deep, deep zoom levels. Um, and then there's also great tricks that are easy to do. Pyramid tile rendering is basically what we call for the, the idea of if you're, if you're iterating over a data source rendering tiles and you encounter a tile with no data, then it's a pretty good bet that you can skip rendering all the children of that tile, which is a huge optimization for worldwide renders. So vector tiles are pretty easy to figure out whether it's a blank tile or not. It's also pretty easy to figure out whether you're working with just a bunch of sandwich um, geometries that might have resulted from clipping out larger polygons, which are outside the extent of a tile. Uh, and you could basically, you can pre-compute that, and often in cases, we use a mask to represent that rather than sending the whole tile over the, over the wire. And then vector tiles are also cool because they support compositing. So you can basically take um, multiple tiles and concatenate them together. Uh, and the Google Proto, Protobuf format basically just allows this. The, it doesn't really matter whether you're parsing two tiles with one layer or one tile with two layers. It's basically the same to the encoders and decoders. So that's really slick because then you can take and mash up multiple data sets on the server side and return them to a client with just one request, which can really help performance. Um, so yeah, this is, this is what you can do. If the ZXYs match, you can just concatenate. And if they don't, then you just reclip one tile and combine them. So this is one thing that the Mapbox API does uh, to help with client-side rendering. So it doesn't matter what the data is. You can combine them uh, from different zoom levels. And another concept that I commonly use is sources. So when we talk about a vector tile source, it's basically multiple vector tiles. And it can be vector tiles in an MB tiles on the file system. It could be a vector tile source at a URL. Or it could be a vector tile source described by a, a metadata file like tile.json. OK, so that's how vector tiles work in a nutshell. I'm sorry if I went too fast. Um, but I wanted to get through that, because now I want to talk about kind of the state of vector tiles, the ultimate goal of the talk, is to frame kind of where we're at. So those of you that want to participate can get a sense of uh, the places that are stable, and the places that are, but all the, also the places that are new and changing, and figure out how you can be involved. So basically, uh, we announced the first version of the spec at State of the Map US and DC in April 2003, or 2013. And um, we released a very minor change in uh, July 2014, just basically clarifying some of the language and the protobuf schema to make it easier for developers to pull in, mostly to C++ apps. But there's been no major changes. Uh, and this month, we are planning on rolling another minor non-breaking change that just clarifies the spec in terms of how ring ordering works in multi-polygons, because this is a point of confusion. So keep, keep an eye on the spec website for uh, that clarification. Uh, and then we're also uh, aiming to add an optional field at the feature level to store rasters. And the idea behind that uh, is not to create a word mash of rasters and vector tiles, but to be able to do compositing that involves legacy image tiles. Because wouldn't it be great if you have a client-side render that just wants to make one request to a sophisticated server that knows how to composite lots of different data types, and some of those might be satellite imagery? You can get back one request, and you can iterate through the layers and have some of those layers be high-resolution aerial imagery, and render those on the fly. So we're, we're uh, aiming to uh, have that be an optional field to allow that. Um, so outside of spec changes, there's a few other important dates. So Mapbox GL was first released in June 2014 publicly. Um, we made one minor switch to how we uh, uh, compress the vector tiles in August 2014. And I'm sorry about if this broke servers. I know that we didn't, didn't do a great job of uh, helping people understand ahead of time. Um, but the idea there is that the way that it's, it's beneficial to take the protobuf and compress it with Zlib, we found. So we do that. So, um, but we intentionally didn't make it as part of the spec because there's so many compression uh, types that you might want to compress data with. 
Um, one that I'm hoping to play around with more is Snappy from Google. But Zlib works great. And so we did Zlib, but Gzip is better because Gzip is basically like Zlib, but it has a few extra headers, so it has better browser support. So we made the switch then to basically have all Mapbox APIs compress vector tiles as Gzip. And I recommend that everyone do that. And if it's a major problem that it's not part of the spec, then we can discuss including it. But for now, we're, we're consistently gzipping and still not planning to be, have it be part of the spec. And then I feel like the other big milestone, if anyone's missed it, that I'm most excited about is just recently this winter when uh, my colleague Vlad wrote GeoJSON VT, which is uh, able to create vector tiles on the fly, fully in browser with basically no dependencies, and really efficiently. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next section of new implementations. Um, so because I'm going to be talking about new implementations rather than current, I don't want anyone to forget that the recommended way to create vector tiles and the way that we support you today is Mapbox Studio. Um, so uh, definitely look to Mapbox Studio. And if you're a power user and you have large data and you have data in the database, then I highly recommend reading everything that Amy Lee writes because she's been focusing on really good documentation about how to author vector tiles and how to design them um, based off data in PostGIS, where you have the full flexibility of SQL to choose what zoom level certain features appear, which can be really critical uh, in making sure that your vector tiles uh, don't include too much data. So Jeff, definitely check out Amy Lee's um, work. And she's going to be doing more and more documentation in the coming months. Um, and I should say that there's many implementations of the vector tile spec already. Again, I'm just going to talk now in detail about a few that I'm excited about. But you can go to the vector tile spec wiki page on GitHub to learn about all of them as they come in. OK, so what are the new ones uh, if you haven't heard? So GeoJSON VT basically, like I said, allows you to create uh, tiles on the fly in browser from GeoJSON and maybe other formats in the future. Um, and it's extremely efficient and elegant because it's able to uh, generate tiles on demand as you zoom in. And instead of a naive implementation like that we do on the server side, where we go to this zoom, zoom level, query the data, clip it, simplify, generate the vector tile, and then repeat that whole process at every zoom level we, we, we render, GeoJSON VT stores in the cache the parent tiles and reclips really uh, elegantly based off their relationships. So you can check out the library on Mapbox uh, GeoJSON VT on GitHub. And I'll just show, um, <clears throat> whoops. I thought this was a video. OK, well, hopefully some of you have seen this before. If not, it's on the website. But it's a, a video from Vlad about how fast it is. OK, so the other one I recommend is uh, Tippecanoe. So this is from Eric Fisher at Mapbox San Francisco office. And this is um, a server-side tool on the command line that is uh, uh, also ingests GeoJSON, but is designed to ingest GeoJSON as large as you can throw at it. So we're talking about easily gigabyte GeoJSON, uh, maybe larger, because it uses a streaming uh, poll-based GeoJSON parser. So it, it, uh, it doesn't consume uh, too much memory. Um, but the key thing about Tippecanoe is it's an experimental hotbed for Eric's ideas about how much data you can fit in vector tiles and still have extremely dense visual maps. So he answers the question of what happens if you're rendering a point map and there's a million points stacked on top of each other. Well, you probably don't have to put all million points that are exactly the same in the vector tile. But you do need to somehow figure out how to represent visually those points as if there's 100 points overlapping. So, um, Check it out on GitHub, Mapbox to Picanoo. Um, and I'll just show you one example. He took New York City taxi data, um, point data of origins and destinations. The data sets something like three, three, 375 million points. And he was able to bake it into a vector tile set where no single vector tile was over a meg once it's compressed. And I think that that, more or less, with multipoints equates to about no more than 200,000 uh, points in a single tile. And you can check out the details of the equations he used in the blog post from today on vector density. Um, and this is just an example of um, zooming in on this really, really dense data set. And so what's happening here is there's vector tiles in the back, and they're being rendered on the fly 
server side in this case, um, all those millions of points. Really quickly. Okay. Now, I want to wrap up by mentioning a few exciting implementations um, beyond the, the company in Mapbox because um, they uh, are perhaps uh, the ones you should use instead of ours. So you get the sense that we're focused on GeoJSON and JavaScript and C++. If you're in the Python world, TileStash is an incredible, um, least sophisticated server. And MapZen has created a backend to TileStash to, uh, to serve up vector tiles. Uh, and they've also abstracted the library into a standalone Python module. So you can just play around with creating them yourself in pure Python, uh, which is amazing. Uh, and then also, uh, t uh, team at Spatial Dev out of Seattle has created a plugin to Leaflet called Leaflet Mapbox Vector Tile. And this one's particularly interesting because um, it basically just plugs into Leaflet uh, without any disturbance. Um, and it renders using Canvas. And it's basically just an optimization. If you were using Tile GeoJSON, you could slip this in and not lose any of the functionality, but be able to benefit from the performance of the smaller size. So um, it's just, I, I think it's awesome because it's, it's, um, low, it's just low disturbance. It's like if you have a project that you just want a little faster, you can slip this technology in under the hood. And you can always move back if there's ever a blocker. So um, yeah, I want to show an example that they shared with me. They built a site uh, called Mapfolio for the Red Cross. And it, it allows a lot of things that people are very familiar with supporting in browser with open layers or leaflet, like filtering vectors by feature, changing a chloropleth style, and feature highlighting and clicking. But instead of on being done on GeoJSON, it's all on um, vector tiles. So I'll just wrap up by playing the video that they shared that shows some of the functionality. And the, I think the point that uh, you should take away is you have no idea that there's tiles under the hood. And I hope that that's increasingly the future with apps is if vector tiles and the vector tile spec are powering them, you don't have to know about it. Uh, and I can just be asleep next year at Foster G, right? I don't have to talk about it, <laughs> perhaps, because it just works this well. Now, of course, it's not that simple. There's a lot of work we want to do in the future. But this is a real tangible image of, I think, how simple it should be. You shouldn't have to know that there's tiles behind that. You just get the benefits. OK, I'll wrap up by just mentioning a few things. Uh, on future work of the vector tile spec, clarifying the spec in terms of polygon ring winding order. I mentioned before, that's what we're going to be working on. And then also exploring the storage Im image data to allow compositing vector tiles with existing imagery and legacy image tiles. Thank you so much. I think I have one minute for questions, yes. So uh, yesterday, Dennis gave a pretty good talk on OSRM. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this vector tiles for new data are for display. Correct. I'm curious kind of what your thoughts are on using vector tile data for other server tools. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, the other bullet that should have been on there in terms of future work is um, experimenting with unioning merging vector tiles into seamless, you know, basically recreating the raw geodata from vector tiles. That's absolutely something we want to experiment with. Um, there's challenges in that, right? Um, and whether you do it server side or client side. But assuming that we could do a really good job of that, um, and I don't see any enormous technical blockers, then you could start to discuss using it for routing. Um, however, um, as you know, supporting routing um, over large areas takes large amounts of data. So there would be a lot of technical problems. So it's not a near-term thing, but I think that's a great thing to be thinking about. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. OK, one more question. In the back? Um, 
Yeah, you know, yeah, there wasn't, yeah, that was definitely simplified. Um, yeah, there's multiple levels of caching. Um, my, my point there was um, that was some of our original motivation in our current architecture. It's not necessarily where we're putting our effort right now. Our effort is in Mapbox GL, so deferring the rendering until just the last moment in your browser. But yeah, for, for our existing system, um, there definitely is a layer of caching of the image tiles because, um, yeah, you don't, you don't want to do the round trip even to S3 um, if you don't have to. Um, it's a, it's a short-term cache because, uh, you know, we, re we really want anyone to be able to upload maps and have them dynamically change. So I think the cache is only like an hour, but, yeah, we do. So that might be near, like, CDN maps. Yes, yeah. The CDN is involved in caching the vector tiles, but definitely, yeah, also the image tiles bef for that, yeah, that legacy endpoint, definitely. Okay, thank you so much for coming, everyone.